The psychological and emotional background for the attainment of the ideal of socio-economic justice can be primarily created by progressive intellectuals in Kashmir and in India. That is a challenge to us all, and we must take up that challenge in a spirit of dedication. I am conscious, and so are all intellectuals in this country conscious, that the process of building up a true modern spirit in tune with the progressive requirements of democracy is a very difficult process indeed. But we cannot avoid accepting the challenge. And it is our proud privilege to stand up to that challenge and make our contribution to the development of a proper intellectual and emotional climate in which the democratic values will be nursed and nurtured and the ideal of Indian democracy will be slowly but inevitably achieved. I feel that even in Pakistan, there must be a class of progressive, forward-looking intellectuals who do not feel happy about the theocratic way of life adopted by Pakistan and who may not be influenced or prejudiced by the Hate India campaign in which Pakistani political power indulges from time to time. Their number may be small today and their voice may be inaudible. But it is my faith that the voice of reason, though inaudible today in Pakistan, may become audible, articulate, and vigorous tomorrow. Let us, therefore, work to establish contacts between the progressive intellectuals in the two countries. We are not concerned with the exercise of political power. We are not concerned with the political battles and fights going on between the two countries. As humans who believe in the progress of the human race, we are concerned to talk to each other with a view to establishing a climate of human progress. Let us open doors of communication as many as we can. Let progressive ideas travel from India to Pakistan and from Pakistan to India. Ideas that give the message of tomorrow and that do not look back at the tragedies and quarrels of yesterday. This hope might sound unrealistic today. It might even sound utopian. But history shows that the utopia of today sometimes becomes the commonplace of tomorrow. When one thinks of it dispassionately, one realizes how India and Pakistan are bound together in many common features. Indeed, it is difficult to visualize any other two countries which have so much in common as India and Pakistan have. Though the two countries became separate under unfortunate and tragic circumstances, let us recall that until two decades ago, we were one country and we have passed through common experiences, good and bad. Is it not true that Mohenjo-daro and Harappa in Pakistan are treated by India as much a part of her history as Delhi, Agra, Ajmer and Lucknow are treated as a part of her history by Pakistan? Look at the languages which are spoken in both the countries. There are three or four languages which are common to both the countries. As a result, think of the literary heroes who are honored by both the countries. Are not our modes of dress common? Is it not true that our food habits and our customs and beliefs are similarly common. Has not India had the same common traditions in music, dancing, art and painting? Did we not share the same sense of values until we parted? After partition, India has been nursing and developing a modern, rational and democratic sense of values, while Pakistan in anger and fury has gone back to theocratic values. Anger and fury make men and communities blind. But India must not retaliate with anger and fury. India must patiently wait and try to remove anger and fury from Pakistan's mind and restore in Pakistan's climate respect for the sense of same sense of values which make the life of the community and of the individual rational, scientific, progressive and forward-looking. That is the dream which the progressive intellectuals of both the countries must continue to dream until it is realized. Today, we have to create an elan of understanding, cooperation and coexistence between the two countries. In course of time, when Pakistan is completely satisfied that force of arms is not going to bring Kashmir to her, and in course of time, when progressive forces assert themselves in Pakistan, and Pakistan in her way turns to the role of secular democracy and begins to pursue the ideal of socio-economic justice, it will be realized by Pakistan as it is realized by India today that the real object of government 
is not to expand national boundaries or to exaggerate the importance of national sovereignty, but it is to make a dedicated pursuit of the happiness of ordinary men and women. It is because it is the beacon call of that ideal which, though distant today, will create the elan of cooperation, understanding, and coexistence between the two countries. Shortly after partition, Nehru gave expression to these feelings in moving words, said Nehru at the Aligarh University. I believe that for a variety of reasons, it is inevitable that India and Pakistan should draw closer to one another, or else they will come into conflict. There is no middle way, for we have known each other too long to be indifferent neighbors. I believe, and indeed, that in the present context of the world, India must develop a closer union with many other neighboring countries. But all this does not mean any desire to strangle or compel Pakistan. Compulsion there never can be, and an attempt to disturb Pakistan would recoil on India's disadvantage. If we had wanted to break Pakistan, why did we agree to the partition? It was easier to prevent it then than to try to do so now after all that has happened. There is no going back in history. As a matter of fact, it is to India's advantage that Pakistan should be a secure and prosperous Since state with which we can develop project. close and friendly relations. If today, by any chance, I were offered the reunion of India and Pakistan, I would decline for obvious reasons. I do not want to carry the burden of Pakistan's great problems. I have enough of my own. Any closer association must come out of the normal process and in a friendly way, which does not end Pakistan as a state, but makes it an equal part of a larger union in which several countries might be associated. Later, however, when the relations between the two countries grew more and more bitter, and the expression of the best sentiments from the one were misunderstood by the other, Nehru became sadder, wiser, and more cautious. Talking to Schlitzberg of the New York Times in March 1957, he said, 20 years ago, I would have said that certainly we should have some kind of confederation, not federation of independent states, with common defense and economic possibility. The difficulty now is, if we talk about it, this upsets our neighbors because we are so much bigger. Nevertheless, of course, this remains the logical future path, confederation with each member nation maintaining its independence intact. In 1960, President Ayub Khan also gave expression to similar sentiments. Writing in Foreign Affairs, President Ayub Khan said, as a student of war and strategy, I can quite clearly see the inexorable push of the North in the direction of the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. This push is bound to increase if India and Pakistan go on squabbling with each other. If, on the other hand, we resolve our problems and disengage our armed forces from facing inwards as they had to do, and we face them outwards, I feel we shall have a good chance of preventing the recurrence of the history of the past, which was that whenever this subcontinent was divided, and it is often divided, someone or other invited outsider stops it. The approach disclosed by these statements of the two leaders of the two countries seems to me to be the right approach which the two countries should themselves adopt. Taking a long view of the progress of history in future, one feels no doubt that in course of time, as the human race marches onwards to its destiny, the exclusive walls created by national sovereignty will have to yield and make room for more and more international cooperation and international interdependence. If only India and Pakistan came together in the social, economic, and cultural fields, how soon they would be able to meet the needs of their common citizens. Nature seems to have made the two countries to help each other rather than to fight each other. Let Kashmir, which is in the occupation of Pakistan, compete with Kashmir, which is with India, in the pursuit of this noble ideal. Let there be more communication between the two parts of Kashmir. Is it not true to say that the rough ceasefire line, which was dictated by the urgent need to establish peace between the two countries, in a sense, broadly represents a proper line of demarcation of the two parts of Kashmir? India should forget her claim that the portion of Kashmir, which is with Pakistan, has been illegally usurped by invasion, contrary to the principles of international law. And Pakistan, in turn, should forget her case that Kashmir should accede to Pakistan, mainly 
if not exclusively on the basis of the two nations theory. If ethnic and linguistic principles are generally considered, the ceasefire line fixed in 1949 would meet the need of a division of the two portions, provided, of course, a few minor adjustments are made in that line. Since 1949, that line has been treated as the boundary between the two portions of Kashmir. The path of wisdom and foresight lies in recognizing it as a permanent boundary between the two portions and bringing to an end this agonizing dispute about Kashmir. Even on this point, Nehru had, at a very early stage, expressed the thought to Mr. Corbell that he would not be opposed to the idea of dividing the country to the ceasefire line. This proposal, however, did not find favor with the powers in Pakistan. It is difficult to prophesy in such matters, but I feel tempted to make the prophecy that ultimately this ceasefire line, perhaps with some suitable adjustments, will be the boundary line between the two portions of Kashmir for good. Whilst I am referring to the future pattern of the relations between India and Pakistan, I cannot forget the historical agreement between the two countries which was signed at Tashkent. By that agreement, the President of Pakistan and the Prime Minister of India have expressed their firm resolve to restore normal and peaceful relations between their countries and to promote understanding and friendly relations between their peoples. They also proclaimed that the interests of peace in their region and particularly in the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent and indeed the interests of peoples of India and Pakistan were not served by the continuance of tension between the two countries. It is on this high moral note that I wish to bring to a close my discussion on Kashmir retrospect and prospect. Passions roused after partition, accentuated by subsequent events, have to die down one day. It is the path of wisdom that both the countries make a deliberate effort to help the process of bringing to an end the era of discord, conflicts and hatred which has disfigured their relations between all the, during all these years. Common men and women of both the countries may be inarticulate, but I have no doubt whatever that they passionately desire that the relations between the two countries should be normalized. That alone will enable them to look forward in their respective regions to an era of progress, prosperity, and happiness. In describing the invasion of Kashmir by the raiders in 1947, I have already referred to the fact that when Magbul Sherwani of Baramula faced death, he shouted, long live Hindu-Muslim unity. I am sure all progressive intellectuals, both in India and in Pakistan, would share my faith and hope that in both the countries, this message from the dying lips of Magbul Sherwani will resound from place to place and take within its benevolent sweep not only the Hindus and Muslims, but all the communities belonging to all the religions which claim the proud privilege of living in India and in Pakistan. That is the way secularism will thrive, and that is the way common men and women of both the countries will find fulfillment of their dream to enjoy in full measure life, liberty, and happiness. Jai Hind. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished lecturer has, if I may so say so, truly redeemed his promise of giving us a logical background, both as to political matters, constitutional matters, and historical matters in regard to Kashmir. I have a vivid memory of an evening late in December 1947 when we met in the then small house which the Prime Minister of India occupied. We were met to settle the draft complaint which was to be presented by India to the United Nations. As we all know, there was a divergence of views. Some took the view that an easy solution to the problem 
would be for the Indian Army to march to the border between Kashmir and Pakistan and leave the initiative thereafter to Pakistan. However, in those days, we had recently attained independence and were new to international affairs. We therefore put our trust in the Security Council some of us thinking that it was like a court of justice which would, after we had stated our facts, would issue, as it were, prohibitory orders on Pakistan, giving effect to our claims and rights. We soon found ourselves in an arena of political pressures and pulls and power blocks and exposed ourselves for years and years to trends which are most unfavorable to us and put us into great difficulties. However, this is that Radio is the course recording. which history followed and what happened, of course, cannot be undone. The learned lecturer has dealt with the problem of Kashmir in all its aspects. He has cogently put India's point of view on the validity of his accession of Kashmir. He has shown us, demonstrating it, by documents and an account of events in the order which they took place, that there was no fraud in the matter of the accession by India. He has also pointed out how the cry repeated by Pakistan numerous occasions and over the years of India's promise of a plebiscite, which she has not carried out, is really without substance. For various reasons, constitutional, factual, and change of circumstances, and so forth. I'm sure the purpose which moved the lecturer to produce these lectures. He's told us that so that foreign questioners may be answered has been amply served by what he has put forward in his lectures. The difficulty which I always found in this convincing the foreigner about the truth and justice of our attitude on Kashmir was the fact that Kashmir had a predominantly Muslim population. The foreigner asked, well, that's the plan on which you have divided your country, and there is no reason why that plan should not be followed and applied to Kashmir. It is true that we heard in the days of division, for the Ratcliffe Tribunal, the slogan always was Muslim majority areas, and that's how we proceeded. But that does injustice to the true position, which is evidenced by facts and history. If all Muslim majority areas or Muslim majority states were to go to Pakistan, how was the question of accession left to be decided by the ruling prince himself, as it was by the British under the Independence Act? Further, we have the glaring facts of history 
that large Muslim populations have lived under Hindu rulers and vice versa. However, the theory that a large Muslim population can live only under a Muslim theocratic state, the theory put forward by the British and largely followed and accepted by Western Europe and in the States. About the prospects of in future of Kashmir, I fully share the hopes which the distinguished lecturer has expressed. But it strikes one whether these hopes are not matters of too remote a history, whether they are not, in the lecturer's own words, utopian. We can judge of the near future by the lessons we have learned in the past. Pakistan has attempted to take Kashmir by force more than once, as we have been told by the lecturer. Apart from these attempts, there has been a continuous propaganda and attempts to infiltrate into the territory so that it may be Pakistan's by subversion. In those circumstances, though we one may wish it, and wish it very much, it's very difficult to hope for a rising influence of intellectuals in Pakistan, which may break, bring about a change in the ideology of those who govern Pakistan. For the immediate future, and that is what the citizen today is concerned with, the first and the foremost need seems to be to keep ourselves ready to meet any aggression which may come from Pakistan or from Pakistan assisted by or combined with China. The language of strength perhaps would bring Pakistan sooner to wise thoughts and a changed ideology in reference to India. By saying this, I do not in the least wish to suggest that we should not pursue the policy of peace, an attempt to come together with Pakistan, which we have pursued for years and which we are still pursuing, notwithstanding the attitude of Pakistan, even after the Pact of Tashkent. Vital equally is a proper and efficient administration of the state of Kashmir. Nobody who knows facts can pretend that the administration of Kashmir over the years has been what it this ought to have been. There is no reason why, as we have done in some other states, able administrators be not sent down from India to handle the administration in that state so that it may be efficient and not corrupt. In, to my mind, the prospect for the immediate future 
if it has to be a safe and favorable prospect, both from the point of view of India and Kashmir, lies in our adoption of principally of the two measures which I have mentioned. If we adopt them, then we can confidently look forward to a prosperous Kashmir integrated into India. Thank you, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we break up, may I say thank you to Sri Kajendra Gadka for a most illuminating series in his own characteristic forthright style on a subject which is not merely topical but which has been uppermost in our minds for a long time. And may I also say thank you to Sri Satilwad for being with us on all the three nights and presided over these lectures with such grace. Thank you. <laughs>